Hi. I'm Buck Van Horn. <laughs> One of the uh, elders here at the church. I just want to welcome everybody here this morning, and uh, thank you for choosing the vineyard. Um, every once in a while, it's been about a year, I think, probably almost exactly a year since I've given a message up here. Uh, and when I was uh, trying to decide what to talk about, the word faith kept coming up uh, in my mind. Um, the past year was, without a doubt, the hardest year that uh, Karen and I have ever been through. Uh, we were both glad to see 2020 roll around, let me tell you. Uh, even though 2019 was a hard year, we made it through. It was our faith that sustained us. It was our faith and trust in God. And with a caveat to that, it was also with the prayers uh, from many, many people that got us through that year. So our faith and trust in God, uh, it helps us to get through the tough times. And I know there are many here today that are facing a tough year. Uh, there's many here that have been through a tough time. And, uh, and there are many people, if you haven't been through a tough time, you're going to face one. So I hope what I share with you today will provide you some level of comfort and some level of hope. So we want to talk about faith. Uh, we start with Hebrews, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Um, chapter 11 in Hebrews, if you want to read a, a good chapter in the Bible about faith, it's chapter 11 in Hebrews. So chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith is like a muscle. It has to be exercised in order to grow. Our faith needs to keep active and it needs to keep growing. Building faith, living and trusting God is a daily experience and we don't want to wait until the hard times come start working on building our faith. Now, faith comes easy when the times are good, but how do we develop a faith that endures the hard times? I want to talk about three things that I think about when I think about faith. First thing is, where does our faith begin? Second thing is, how is our faith validated? And the third thing is, putting our faith into action. So point number one, where does faith begin? Faith begins when you are born again. Faith begins when you're saved. I want to talk about two of the things that we receive when we are saved. One is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us that gift of faith. And the second thing is the eternal life with God. The eternal life we have with God is our reward for being faithful. Second thing. How is our faith validated? It's validated in the Bible. Uh, in Romans 10, it says that faith comes from hearing God's word. Now, if we don't hear God's word, and if we don't hear that Jesus came back to bring us into an intimate relationship with God and into an eternal life with him, then we won't have the faith we need to experience that. Then the third thing I want to talk about is... Uh, our faith in action, and that's our daily walk with God. So, before we get started, let's pray. Lord, I'm just so thankful for all that you've done. So thankful for all these people that are here today. So thankful for our families, for our friends, for the help and the support that they give. Lord, I just thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit and the faith that you give us. Lord, guide us in all that we do. Uh, help us, teach us, uh, and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Point number one, where our faith begins. We must be born again. Two of the many things that we receive when we become saved is when we are born again, is the Holy Spirit and eternal life. So let me start with eternal life. That is the cornerstone of the Christian faith, of our faith, the cornerstone of my faith. Eternal life, the existence of life after death, is a difficult concept for me to understand. I think that Job speaks for all of us when he said, 
A man born of a woman is of a few days, and those days are full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. If a man dies, will he live again? That's found in Job chapter 14. Two weeks ago, Pastor Doug spoke about eternal life, and one of the verses he used was James chapter 4 and verse 14. While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? Are you, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Is that all there is to this life? Like Job, I think all of us have been challenged by this question. Exactly what happens to us after we die? Do we just cease to exist? Does everyone go to the same place or do we go to different places? Is there really a heaven and a hell? Well, the Bible tells us that there is not only life after death, but there is an eternal life so glorious that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, God in the form of man, came to earth to give us this gift of eternal life. Jesus took, us, took the punishment that all of us deserve, and he sacrificed his life to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Three days later, he overcame death by rising from the grave. He remained on earth for 40 days and was witnessed by hundreds before ascending to heaven. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The resurrection of Christ is a well-documented event. The Apostle Paul challenged people to question eyewitnesses for its validity, and no one was able to contest the truth. The resurrection is the cornerstone of Christian faith. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we can have faith that we will be resurrected. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate proof of life after death. Christ was first. All of us who have been born again, who put our faith in the resurrection of Jesus, will be raised to life again. Physical death started with Adam, but all of us who have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ will have a new life. And that's found in Corinthians chapter 15. Just as God resurrected Jesus' body, we will be resurrected upon Jesus' return. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that it is appointed for us to die only once, and after that will come the judgment. We who have been saved by faith in Christ will go into an eternal life in heaven. But like Pastor Doug stated two weeks ago, those who reject Christ as a Savior will be sent to eternal punishment in hell. That's Matthew uh, chapter 25. Through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we will live forever in heaven with Jesus as our ruler. In John 11, 25 and 26, it says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In John 3, 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And then Revelations 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. The old order of things has passed away. And consider the famous words in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life is the anchor and the cornerstone of our Christian faith. 
my faith. The promise of eternal life allows us to have a strong faith in Christ. Even if our struggles lead us to physical death, which will happen to all of us, we have eternal life. So no matter what we face in this life, we know that we can stand firm and know that the best part of life is going to come ahead of us. The best is yet to come. That gives me a comfort and it gives me a strong faith. And I, I just ask you, don't leave here today without the assurance that you have eternal life with Christ. Okay, the second thing we receive when we are saved is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why do we need the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith, and it also gives us the tools that we need to help our faith grow. Okay, the Holy Spirit does many things in our lives as believers. He is our helper. He is an advocate for our lives. I know that when I've gone through tough times, it's good to have somebody in my corner, somebody who's willing to fight for me, stand up for me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. In John 14, verse 26, it says that he is our advocate. He fights for us. He does that by reminding us of all the promises that Jesus has made to us. The Holy, the Holy Spirit assists us in our prayer life. He intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with with the will of God. The Holy Spirit gives us joy and peace. He comforts us as we go throughout our lives, especially when we face some of the battles, the hardships, and the hostility that we encounter in our lives. It's during these times of hardship, when we trust in God for our guidance, that our faith in Him grows. In Romans 15, verse 13, it says that God is the one who gives us hope and causes us to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification. Sanctification is other work that the Holy Spirit gives us, uh, us as believers. I've always had trouble trying to figure out what sanctification really means. So in the essence, the Holy Spirit stands with us and helps us fight against the desires of our flesh and leads us in the right direction. The more we yield ourselves over to the will of the Holy Spirit, the desires of our flesh become less evident, and the fruits of the Spirit become more evident, and our faith grows. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25, those who belong in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also a gift giver. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts as we need them and as He determines. Some of those gifts are, of course, faith, wisdom, knowledge, healing, and so on. Since we receive the Holy Spirit when we become saved, he helps us to comprehend the thoughts of God when we read the Bible. The Spirit helps us understand the Bible. This is God's wisdom. It's not our own. No amount of human knowledge can ever replace the Holy Spirit's teaching and wisdom. And that wisdom and knowledge helps grow our faith. I have a friend, a very wealthy, intelligent, successful man. I've been able to talk to him about God, uh, but he's not a believer. I've had several opportunities to speak with him and we talk about God and the Bible. But uh, he told me he's read the Bible, but he never got anything out of it. And that always puzzled me because when I read the Bible, it speaks out to me. So 
I brought this up to Karen because I always go to her for all the right answers. She told me that if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, the Bible is just another book. So anyhow, this story segues me into my second point of my message, and that is, why do we need to read the Bible? Okay, point two. Where is our faith validated? It's validated when we read the Bible. We need to learn His Word through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. So how does that, this help grow our faith? There are several reasons we need to read it and understand. The Bible develops my faith because of the Bible is totally reliable and without error. The Bible is unique among so-called holy books in that it does not merely give us a moral and say, trust me. Rather, we have the ability to test by checking the hundreds of detailed prophecies that it makes, by checking the historical accounts that it records, and by checking the scientific facts that it relates. The Bible has been challenged by hundreds of people, but has never been found to be in error. A good book to read that validates the Bible is The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. The Bible is consistent from beginning to the end. It starts out by telling us that God created us because he loves us and he wants us to love him. It tells us how we fell from grace because we were deceived. That God made a way for us to be reconciled back to him through Jesus Christ. And then it ends up with us being brought together with him for an eternal life in heaven. But don't take my word for it. Research the validity of the Bible for yourself. I guarantee that it will help grow your faith. So why should we read and study the Bible? Because God does not change, and our sin nature does not change. The Bible is as relevant for us today as it was when it was written. Some people think, with all the advancements that, that mankind has made, that the Bible is outdated. But it says in Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 9, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And while mankind as a whole continues to seek love, affirmation, and satisfaction in all of the wrong places, God, our creator, tells us that if we put our faith in him, no matter what comes up, our, you know, no matter what comes our way, up and to including physical death, he will bring us to a lasting joy and eternal life with him. God's word, the Bible. It's so important that Jesus told us in Matthew 4.4, 4, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, if we want to develop an enduring faith, one that's going to get us through the hard times that God has intended for us to do, we need to listen to him and obey him. Another reason we need to read the Bible is that more and more people are developing their own arbitrary standards and values. They no longer believe in absolute truth. There is so much false teaching in the world, and all of this false teaching starts to erode our faith. So where can we find absolute truth? The Bible gives us the standard by which we can distinguish truth from lies. It tells us what God is like. It will steer us clear of following wrong doctrines, which in the end will lead us into idol worship, which is just misplaced faith. The Bible will lead us to the truth and into eternal life. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So faith is like, like a muscle. You need to exercise it. You need to keep it growing. In the Bible, there are many stories about people who decided to live by faith in God and persevered. There are also many stories in the Bible about people who turned their backs on God and perished. So reading and studying the Bible helps us see beyond the attractive nature of sin to the painful realities of sin and temptation. We can learn from others' mistakes rather than making them ourselves. Experience is a great teacher. 
But when it comes to learning from sin, it is a terribly hard teacher. It's so much better for us to learn from others' mistakes. There are so many Bible characters to learn from, some of which can serve as both positive and negative uh, characters throughout their times in the Bible. For example, David. David defeated Goliath by putting his faith in God, putting his faith and trust in God. That story teaches us that God is greater than anything he asks us to face. Later in his life, David commits adultery with Bathsheba. That story reveals just how long and la- how long lasting and how terrible the consequences of sin are. I think that if each of us look at our own lives and on the lives of others, we can see this playing out every day. Reading the stories of the people in the Bible helps grow my faith by allowing me to realize that those people in the, in the Bible are no different than me. If they can put their faith in God and persevere, so can I. So the Bible is the handbook of our life. The Bible is God's word. If we ignore it, we ignore it at our own peril. And I cannot emphasize strongly enough just how important the Bible is to our lives and to our faith. Studying the Bible can be compared to mining for gold. If we make a little effort and merely sift through the sands in the stream, we'll only find a little bit of gold dust. But the more we make an effort to really dig in, the more the reward we will gain for our effort, and the more our faith will grow. This brings me to my third point, our faith in action. How do we live out our faith in our daily walk? I'm going to read a lot of scripture here. So if you go to James chapter 2, and this is verses 14 through 26, you can uh, read along with me. In James chapter 2, 14 through 26, it talks about the relationship between our Father and our deeds. The relationship between faith and deeds. The relationship between faith and our actions. So we'll read this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is only one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith made him complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. I want to be God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. So in the same way, was not even Rahab, prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and then sent them off in a different direction? In one of verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Obedience to God is the mark of enduring faith. Obedience shows itself in action. It's one thing to say, I believe in God. But it's another thing to demonstrate your faith in action. So faith without works is dead because it shows a heart that has not been transformed by God. Faith, which cannot be seen, becomes visible when we are obedient to God. Faith without works is dead because we've been saved. We are new creations. 
We've all been born again. One thing that has grown my faith is that after I was saved, I changed. I talked differently. I acted differently. I thought differently. My old self passed away, and I became a new person. Worldly people just don't get that. The actions that result from our salvation are just a natural progression of our faith. So let me repeat that. The actions that result from our salvation are just a natural progression of our faith. So let me wrap this all up. Our faith in God starts when we become saved or born again. When we are saved, we receive the promise of eternal life with God, which is the cornerstone of Christian faith. Because Jesus was resurrected, resurrected we can have the faith that whatever we face, up until including death, we will have eternal life with Christ, a better life. I have faith that the best part of life is yet to come. We also receive the Holy Spirit when we're saved. The Holy Spirit gives us the gift of faith and the tools that will grow our faith. He's our advocate. He's in our corner through the tough times. He helps with our prayers. He gives us joy and peace and sanctifies us. He keeps us on the right path. Reading and studying the Bible validates our faith. The Bible has stood the test of time, and we can have faith in its truths. It gives us an example of real people who, through faith, persevered. Those stories give us the assurance that we can persevere, too. It's as still as rel relevant today as it was when it was written. There's nothing new under the sun. So as we go through this life, our unseen faith will become visible by our deeds. Our deeds are evidence that God has transformed us. Our faith changes our lives. We become new people. Which brings me back, it brings me back to salvation. Have you been transformed by God? Have the worship team come back up. We will not be given the opportunity to accept God's gift of salvation and eternal life after death. Our eternal destination is determined by our earthly lifetimes, by accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 6, verse 2, it says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. If we trust the death of Jesus Christ was the full payment for our sin against God, we are guaranteed not only a meaningful life on earth, but also eternal life after death in the presence of Christ. Could everyone bow their heads? If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you want an eternal life with God in heaven, now's the time. If you want to be saved, I just ask that you would look up at me. Like Denny always says, we're not, going to, we're not here to embarrass anybody. This is just between you and God. In a moment, I will be saying a prayer. And you can say this prayer along with me. I just want to tell you that saying a prayer, saying this prayer, is not what saves you. It's our faith in Christ that saves us. Prayer is just a means of demonstrating this faith. So I'm going to look through the room one more time. So I'm going to say this prayer. It's a way to express to God your faith in him and to thank him for providing you with your salvation. Let's pray.
God, I know I have sinned against you and deserve punishment. But Jesus Christ took on the punishment that I deserved so that through faith in him, I could be forgiven. I place my trust and my faith in you for salvation. Thank you for your wonderful grace and for your forgiveness and for the gift of eternal life. Amen. Thank you. As always, the front of the church here is going to be open. If you want to pray for something, if you want to pray for someone, if you want someone to pray for you, please feel welcome to come up. Thanks.